Past. A sick monarch, human sacrifices at his death, burial orgies. While I was in Honolulu, I witnessed the ceremonious funeral of the king's sister, Her Royal Highness, the Princess Victoria. According to the royal custom, the remains had lain in state at the palace 30 days, watched day and night by a guard of honor. And during all that time, a great multitude of natives from the several islands had kept the palace grounds well crowded and had made the place a pandemonium every night with their howlings and wailings, beating of tom-toms and dancing of the, at other times, forbidden hula hula by half-clad maidens to the music of songs of questionable decency chanted in honor of the deceased. The printed program of the funeral procession interested me at the time, and after what I had just said of Hawaiian grand elo eloquence in the matter of playing empire, I am persuaded that a perusal of it may interest the reader. After reading the long list of dignitaries, etc., and remembering the sparseness of the population, one is almost inclined to inclined to wonder where the material for that portion of the procession devoted to Hawaiian population generally is going to be procured. Undertaker, Royal School, Kauai Ho School, Roman Catholic School, Mime School, Honolulu Fire Department, Mechanics Benefit Union, Attending Physicians, Kono Hikis, Superintendents of the Crown Lands. Kono Hikis of the Private Lands. Of His Majesty Kono Hikis of Private Lands of Her Late Royal Highness. Governor of Oahu and Staff. Hulu Manu, Military Company. Household Troops. The Prince of Hawaii's own Military Company. The King's Household Servants, Servants of Her Late Royal Highness, Protestant Clergy, the Clergy of the Roman Catholic Church, His Lordship Louis Magre, the Right Reverend Bishop of Arathea, Vicar Apostolic of the Hawaiian Islands, the clergy of the Hawaiian Reformed Catholic Church, His Lordship the Right Reverend Bishop of Honolulu. Hearse, escort, Hawaiian Cavalier, large kahilas, small kahilas, pallbearers. Escort, Hawaiian Cavalry, large kahilas, ranks of long-handled mops made of gaudy feathers, sacred to royalty. They are stuck in the ground around the tomb and left there. Small Kahila's pallbearers. Her Majesty Queen Emma's carriage, His Majesty's staff, carriage of Her Late Royal Highness, carriage of Her Majesty the Queen Dowager, the King's Chancellor, cabinet ministers, his Excellency, the Minister Resident of the United States, HIM's Commissioner, HBM's Acting Commissioner, Judges of Supreme Court, Privy Councilors, Members of Legislative Assembly, Councilor Corps, Circuit Judges, Clerks of Government Departments, Members of the Bar, Collector General, Custom House Officers and Officers of the Customs, Marshal and Sheriffs of the different islands, King's Yeomanry, Foreign Residents, Awahai Kahumana, ooh, <coughs> right, Hawaiian Population Generally, Hawaiian Cavalry, Police Force. I resume my journal at the point where the procession arrived at the Royal Mausoleum. As the procession filed through the gate, the military deployed handsomely to the right and left and formed an avenue through which the long column of mourners passed to the tomb. Are you stuck? 
<laughs> You're right. The coffin was borne through the door of the mausoleum, followed by the king and his chiefs, the great officers of the kingdom, foreign councils, ambassadors, and distinguished guests. Burlingame and General Van Valkenburg. Asshole. Sit here and Several of the Kahilas where they fastened to a framework in front of the tomb. There to remain until they decay and fall to pieces. Or for stalling this until another scone of royalty dies. <laughs> Yo, dude. Yo, dude. You're messing with the flow. Okay? At this point of the proceedings, the multitude set up such a heartbroken wailing as I hope never to hear again. The soldiers fired three volleys of musketry. The wailing being previously silenced to permit of the guns being heard. His Highness Prince William, in a showy military uniform, the true prince, this coin of a, the house, overthrown by the present dynasty. He was formally betrothed to the princess, but was not allowed to marry her. Stood guard and paced back and forth within the door. The privileged few who followed the coffin into the mausoleum remained some time, but the king soon came out and stood in the door and near one side of it. A stranger could have guessed his rank, although he was so simply and, un and unpretentiously dressed, by the profound difference paid him by all persons in his vicinity, by seeing his high officers receive his quiet orders and suggestions with bowed and uncovered heads and by observing how careful those persons who came out of the mausoleum were to avoid crowding him, although there was room enough in the doorway for a wagon to pass for that matter. How respectfully they edged out sideways, scraping their backs against the wall and always presenting a front view of their persons to his majesty, and never putting their hats on until they were well out of the royal presence. He was dressed entirely in black, dress coat and silk hat, and looked rather democratic in the midst of the showy uniforms about him. On his breast he wore a large gold star, which was half hidden by the lapel of his coat. He remained at the door a half hour, and occasionally gave an order to the men who were erecting the Cahalis before the tomb. He had the good taste to make one of them substitute black crepe for the ordinary hempen rope he was about to tie one of them to the framework with. Finally, he entered his carriage and drove away, and the populace shortly began to drop into his wake. While he was in view, there was but one man who attracted more attention than himself, and that was Harris, the Yankee Prime Minister. This feeble personage had crape enough around his hat to express the grief of an entire nation, and as usual he neglected no opportunity of making himself conspicuous and exciting the admiration of the simple Canicus. Oh, noble ambition of this modern Richelieu. Because David and Brenna got ahead for home. Are you not going to eat or what? It is interesting to contrast the funeral ceremonies of the Princess Victoria with those of her noted ancestor, Kamahumea, the Conqueror, who died 50 years ago in 1819, the year before the first missionaries came. On the 8th of May, 1819, at the age of 66, he died as he had lived in the faith of his country. It was his misfortune not to have come in contact with men who could have rightly influenced his religious aspirations. Judged by his advantages and compared with the most eminent of his countrymen, he may be justly styled not only great but good. To this day, his memory warms the heart and elevates, warms the heart and elevates the national feelings of Hawaiians. They are proud of their old warrior king. I, I heard, heard. They love his name, his deeds from their historical age, and an enthusiasm everywhere prevails, shared even by foreigners who knew his worth, that constitutes the firmest pillar of the throne of his dynasty. 
In lieu of human victims, the custom of that age, a sacrifice of 3,300 dogs attended his obesquity cues. No mean holocaust when their national value and the estimation in which they were held are considered. The bones of Kamahicha, after being kept for a while, well, then we're not going to have dinner until I'm ready. We're so carefully concealed that all knowledge of their final resting place is now lost. There was a proverb current among the common people that the bones of a cruel king could not be hid. They made fish hooks and arrows of them, upon which in using them they vented their abhorrence of his memory in bitter execrations. The account of the circumstances of his death, as written by the native historians, is full of minute detail. But there is scarcely a line of it which does not mention or illustrate some bygone custom of the country. In this respect, it is the most comprehensive document I have yet met with. I will quote it entire. When Kama Hamia was dangerously sick and the priests were unable to cure him, they said, be of good courage and build a house for the god his own private god or idol, that thou mayest recover. The chiefs corroborated this advice of the priests, and a place of worship was prepared for Kakil Imuku and consecrated in the evening. They proposed also to the king, with a view to prolong his life, that human victims should be sacrificed to his deity upon which the greater part of the people absconded through fear of death and concealed themselves in hiding places till the taboo taboo pronounced taboo means prohibition we have borrowed it or sacred the taboo was sometimes permanent sometimes temporary and the person or thing placed under taboo was for the time being sacred to the purpose for which it was set apart in the above case, the victims selected under the taboo would be sacred to the sacrifice, in which destruction impended was passed. And it is doubtful whether Kama Humea approved of the plan of the chiefs and priests to sacrifice men, as he was known to say. The men are sacred for the king, meaning that they were for the service of his successor. This information was derived from Liholeho, his son. After this, his sickness increased to such a degree that he had not strength to turn himself in his bed. When another season consecrated for worship at the new temple, Haya, arrived, he said to his son, Liholeho, go thou and make supplication to thy God. I am not able to go and will offer my prayers at home. When his devotions to his feathered God, Kuk, Eliamuku were concluded, a certain religiously disposed individual who had a bird god suggested to the king 